Okay, so we are ready to start uh, this session. Good evening to all the uh, in-person conference uh, attendees and good afternoon, good morning to all the remote uh, attendees. In case you don't know me, my name is Giuliano Casale. I'm currently chair of Symmetrics. And on behalf of the award selection committee and the city as a whole, I'm delighted to recognize today with the 2022 Symmetrics uh, Achievement Award, uh, Balaji uh, Prabhakar who is a VMware a Founders Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Stanford University. I will spend a few minutes to highlight some of Balaji's main achievements. The Symmetric Achievement Award we give today recognizes in particular his outstanding contributions to applied probability and the theory and design of internet algorithms, data center networks, and social networks. Societal networks. Uh, Balaji is also notable for having settled uh, important open questions uh, such as the Raymond Simon conjecture for Q in tandems and the Parisi and Copper Smith uh, uh, Sorkin conjectures for the random assignment uh, problem. One of the most uh, striking aspects, in my view, of Balaji's career uh, is also his distinctive ability to translate his research. Uh, into high impact uh, real world uh, solutions as he has uh, demonstrated, for example, with his work on urban mobility at Urban Engines, uh, a startup founded in this uh, area of mobility that was later acquired in 2006 by Google. He has also contributed uh, extensively to the design of commercially successful uh, data center switches. And more recently, his work on clock synchronization is gaining traction uh, in the world uh, of finance. Uh, Balaji has been already a recipient of many honors uh, and awards. Uh, there are far too many to list them all uh, here, but let me mention that he's a fellow of both uh, ACM and I IEEE, a recipient of two IEEE Technical Field Awards, and of the Erlang Prize by Informs APS. His papers have received, among others, the the 2008 Symmetrics Best Paper Award, the 2018 Symmetrics Test of Time Award, and recently the 2021 Test of Time Award at SICOM. I'm sure you must also be very proud to have contributed to forming multiple generations of top researchers, several of which are also active in Symmetrics and performance. Today is going to give us his perspective on some of the mathematical models that he has worked on over the years. And what a better place, of course, than the great and busy city of Mumbai to discuss the subject of uh, congestion. I'm sure we will have plenty of time to reflect on this letter today as we head back all of the traffic to our hotels. So uh, Balaji, welcome and congratulations on this uh, well-deserved uh, honor. I'm very happy to present to you the uh, 22, 22 Achievement Award plate uh, and a gift. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, good day to folks on, on Zoom. Uh, I'm really honored, first of all, uh, very uh, humbled and delighted also to be the recipient of this award. Um, thanks to all the amazing work that the local organizers have done, JK, Manjanath, and Giuliano. It's been great interacting with you through this process. <coughs> amazing conference here that you guys have organized. Um, so I thought I'd go through a few things that I have learned or observed over time about performance analysis. Why is it that sometimes it uh, works really well? Why is it in some other, some other systems, in the systems context, it doesn't work 
so well, or perhaps not even at all, what makes things, again, is a personal perspective, okay? And uh, I'm also going to, um, I'm also going to press the slides. So first, the title, uh, while very interesting, is not original. It's uh, borrowed from Eugene Wigner's famous piece. If you haven't read it, it's nine pages long. Definitely worth a read. And uh, he, he has done a more in-depth study of what he set out to do. I'm just beginning. So I actually hope to interact with you folks and others to see if we can understand and fill in some of the blanks in, in my understanding of, of what makes us, what makes uh, theory tick in this world, okay? Um, second is that it's been a personal quest and really to understand what role theory has played in, in Pakistan's networks, especially. Um, as always with these things, you know, I will try and present a coherent thesis, uh, drawing on various different experiences such as working in industry in academia, uh, as a theorist at the intersection of uh, the fields that matter to this community, and as a, a close collaborator of system builders, okay? And some gross assumptions will be made to just, you know, cover ground. Um, so please excuse me. And also, you know, the references are going to be incomplete by nature of this style of presentation. So, you know, help me complete it. Please don't be angry at me, okay? Um, <clears throat> so what's the setting? So if you look at distributed systems back as with networks, in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, they arrived together uh, as a replacement for mainframe computing and uh, circuit switching. And the... Uh, they had a symbiotic relationship in that the definition of a distributed system is a system whose components are located on different networked computers, which communicate and coordinate their actions by passing messages to achieve a common goal. Okay, so the networks were just built in. And there are three key characteristics of distributed systems is from the same wiki page. First is that components should, shall operate concurrently and the failures will be independent. That is, if, if, a, if one component fails, I'm going to take the whole system down. And there's a lack of a global clock. This is in yellow because I'll be referring to it in the second part of my talk. And there are many examples. I've listed a few here. It's hard to think of a large-scale modern system that is not a distributed system. Okay, there's very few, if any, that are centralized. It's very expensive to build centralized systems, much cheaper to build distributed systems. And so I want to motivate this observation, the observation being the one I'm about to make from two sides. First is, if you look at the practice, if you go to industry and spend time working with people actually building these systems, or even the architects, they are from the system side of the CS and E, disciplines. The last time that we might all have been in the same class together was probably undergraduate at the level of bachelor's degree. After that, they went to a certain branch of this sort of knowledge tree, we went to a different branch. Okay. And, you know, the familiar basic theory, but nothing like what we do here. Okay. So what's happened is that the design and deployment of large-scale systems has occurred with you know, hardly any advanced theory input necessarily. Okay, if you go to Cisco and see people build boxes, and, you know, sometimes Mick McLean, my colleague at Sanford and I, who've been teaching package switched architectures for 10 years, are surprised to find that they don't know about our course. Okay, it has mattered in some small way, but not necessarily in a big way, if it doesn't matter at all. Okay. Um, if you look at things like databases and stuff, there is theory, again, you know, but not in the way that we, we tend to do this, okay? And uh, certainly in operating systems, fault tolerance systems, 
the, the world of uh, consensus protocols as an example, the whole argument is a theoretical argument, but it's of the correctness type. It's not about performance. Okay. So I say theory, I mean performance type theory in the main. So obviously algorithms are used heavily and you know they they have there's a lot of theory in that. I'm not talking about that. Okay. In network, and then you might say, well, which other areas have performance analysis theory? Well, you'll see a lot of the stuff that is at the lower levels, like on the EE side, theory just naturally comes in. Okay, so so it's in, it's in connection with that. It's on the right hand side of the slide. You'll see. So uh, surprisingly, it's effective in performance analysis. And the question is, you know, how did this happen? I mean, if if the guys out there are building and deploying stuff and operating it without our input and are talking to us, and yet we somehow seem to connect with them and derive motivation and contribute, and it seems to go. And what are these contributions? Uh, I want to just highlight a few of those. Now, as a theory, it's probably amongst the best that we know, meaning it's 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 attracted really by talent. Uh, there's everybody from uh, the engineering math end of the spectrum to just the pure probabilist who's worked on this. Uh, and it's on a par with control theory, signal processing, information theory, communications of the, in the E world and CS world, algorithms, analysis, math programming, game theory. In fact, it even intersects with a lot of these things. But unlike the other theories, ours wasn't born with the practical questions necessarily. Like in the 70s, no one sort of said, hey, theory guys, you know, we want to do something, tell us what we should do. They started to build stuff. Okay. Um, it doesn't grow up in practice. I mean that you know someone's waiting and then something is filled in from theoreticians. By theoreticians, then the practice advances, and then it's not like that. So, for example, coding theory in areas like that that happens. Okay. Cryptography. Uh, yet we found ourselves somehow we're at the right place at the right time. We're consistently okay amazing ability to evolve so we've definitely what's called stayed relevant okay we've not gone out of fashion uh we don't have to pause on arrivals wasn't, wasn't true doesn't mean you roll all of game theory and throw it away and then we can just go home that didn't happen we found a way to keep going okay so how did that happen okay how do we connect with practice and how does the theory advance? Okay, so my thesis comes in three parts. Okay, so first is I'm gonna call it free will. Um, if you look at the stack, I won't put all the layers, presentation is missing, not really relevant. Uh, the method is introduced as a, where the action starts. So distributed systems of the database, consensus protocols, ledgers, everybody lives as an application on top of us in this layered model. We are accessed through things called sockets. Just think of them as holes in the ground. These guys will drop sh stuff down the chute, a file or a packet or whatever. And our job is to do run messages as fast as possible. Otherwise we'll hear complaints from them. So we're the messenger boys, girls, etc., of the distributed systems world, okay? Transport and network is where we look because that's where the interconnect fabric that connects all these nodes in the distributed system are. And network theory is actually successful here in the main. Now, we don't go so far down as worry about what happens to waves or waveforms or you know, we, we, we're already, the zeros and ones already formed themselves. We're at least bit land. But both is a tremendous amount of theory, and there's a lot of uh, activity even now, okay? And what I want to say is this sort of one is Maslow's indices or hierarchy of needs kind of arrow, think of it that way. I'm going to say, there's a very high free will on top. Clearly, user decides what they want to do. They want to book an Airbnb room, but they're not really interested because they want to see something 
off in TikTok on the side for a second and they'll come back. They decide what they want to do, when they want to do it. We just have to be waiting for them. So I'm going to just say that free will is high on top and low at the bottom. So this is where wishes are made and bottom is where wishes are fulfilled. Our ability to rapidly grow, uh, uh, the ability to rapidly grow and reconfigure is very pri is priced at the top, flexibility, etc. Performance is priced at the bottom. Okay, speed, efficiency, you know, low delay, low drops. Because of this free will thing, it's really hard to model. I mean, it's, if, you, if you sit and start looking at the number of different things that you have to do to capture an adequate model of something like an operating system, it's just going to be difficult. Those things take interrupts, okay? And they, they don't have to work all the time. They're, they're energy saving mode sometimes. And then they like to call less interrupts. They do various things, okay? So often we're simply knocking on the door of an operating system to be let in after having come out of the wire. Okay. And um, at the bottom end, clear if it's naturally because there's less free will. I, that's what I want to say. The job job description is clear. And with that is what I think where we get uh, an ability to theorize. Just because the description of the job is simple, very clear. What is that description? Very easy. Provide the highest throughput to sockets and the lowest delay to packets, subject to fairness constraints. So sockets are going to compete, arbitrate, make it fair. Other than that, maximize throughput and minimize loss or delays. Okay? We so now recognize this as a goal, because that's what we've been designing to. Sorry, let me take this off. The second part is with a certain natural quality to claim theory. What I'm going to say it's a natural theory, even though it's looking at man made systems, systems are cues are not, they don't, you don't go and find it in nature. Animals are not, they may be queuing actually, they like to cross a river in this crocodile and fast, they, they may be, but there are no cues in the animal world. It's, it's, it's a human creation. Okay. But yet there's natural in the sense that. Uh, there's, the definitions are clear, there's a server, someone's waiting on you, someone does, does the work. You can ask questions, how long is the queue, how long is it going to get for me to wade through the queue called search on time. It's actually pretty natural. A bookkeeping procedure can be codified and, you know, for single server queue, you know what it is, it's called Lindley's recursion. It's just there, it's a formula, okay? And networks must obey conservation laws. So let me take about each of these things, success or queuing theory is statistical models. So for example, the amazing MM1Q. It's about as fundamental to us as the Gaussian channel is in communications or information theory, or linear time invariant systems are in control or signal processing of that matter, or two-person uh, game payoff matrix. Once you have these things, you can just amazingly generate a whole theory about them. A whole semester can go by just looking at these things. That's what I mean. Okay, and it's a natural fit with the problems of the field. And it captures everything of interest. It's fully tractable, it gives close form expressions. And the entire Markov and model family more or less come out, comes out of the MM1Q type, you know, birthday chain. It's about as easy as, as, as it can get. MMK, Burke's theorem, Jackson networks, BCMP, and Kelly type networks. Where the writing is not probabilistic, if you don't, BCMP and Kelly networks, they're both the same thing, let's say, and they, the routing can be specific to a job class. And yet, uh, that sort of thing, when I say that, you, you know, as a probabilist, you'll say, that destroys independence. It does. When you flip coins, independence is promoted. When you don't flip coins, independence is destroyed, generally speaking. And yet, it works. And some of the grease is just right. Okay, so it's beautiful. And mostly, at the end of the day, if you say, what is it that we gave up on linearity, we gave up on this, what, what is it that works? It's reversibility. The systems of queues are reversible, by and large, or what Frank Kelly calls quasi-reversible, when they're not exactly reversible. And it just works, everything works. Flow balance, it's beautiful, the whole theory. 
more or less everything up to the 70s can be just put in that, uh, you know, book of, of Klein Rock notably and Kelly and about a few others. And structural results are, this is independent of probabilities. The most famous is Little's Law, average waiting time and average Q, Q size are related by average Q size equals arrival rate times average waiting. That's just universally true. There's no, you don't have to have any rest, uh, restrictions on arrival and service distributions. Uh, the fact that the kth moment of services is finite implies k minus one moment of waiting times is finite is fact of um, single server cubes. Okay. This, uh, the easiest way to see this is Polacci Kinchin formula as an example. As I mentioned, then is recursion on uh, Lawrence's construction. There are a bunch of these things that just are distribution free. Then, why should the systems be stable? Well, the real reason is just very simple. There are conservation laws. Okay. First of all, the network conserves flow. What comes in must go out. It doesn't accumulate stuff. Sometimes it may get long queues and stuff in it, but everything that comes in has to leave. The network is not a destination. It's always just an, a, a place of transit. Okay. The, the network must conserve work. That is, so long as there's work, it shouldn't idle. Unless something like power save is turned on. Okay. I said, forget vacations. I mean, you know, there's, there's, we've all seen queues of vacations. But in communication, there are no queues of vacations. Power save is the only kind of vacation there is. Okay. So, again, remember, free will, lack of free will means no vacations. You will be working all the time. Gives rise to stability theory. Uh, there are several varieties of this. In the Markovian setting, or more generally, there's the drift analysis, which uh, Bruce Hyde notably started off and very nicely and fairly comprehensively followed up with Tessilos and Ephraimides. Uh, Mine and Treaty had a nice book on this. And in the, in the, I came to the world of switching and uh, through this paper by McHugh and Anantrama Walron. Uh, Jim Dai introduced fluid models. Which found a lot of success in re-entrant lines, these manufacturing networks where jobs can go back a few times. And uh, there are the, uh, Maury Bramson had a very notable papers on, uh, is, it, is it true that if the arrival rate at a queue is less than the service rate, and that's true on all the queues in the network, then automatically the system is stable? The answer surprisingly is no, okay? And here's a brilliant counter example. Motivated by work previously by Lou and Kumar and Rupko Stoliar. Then there's a so called omega by omega or pathwise approach. Lawrence's construction is, is, is the main starting point for these things. It actually anticipates coupling from the past. Lawrence's construction is really quite nice. Um, motivated by Bacheli and Foss, Bambus and uh, I want to say Pierre Bremer is involved in this because his book with Bacheli is probably one of the more influential books in King theory. And so, <clears throat> so there's a successful second order theory after the first order business of stability is taken care of. The second order business of delays and stuff uh, are dealt with, there's a successful theory uh, in the form of this uh, heavy traffic or brown emotion analysis or cues. Uh, the notable uh, persons here, actually it was introduced by Kingman, you know, of from the famous probabilist. And, and in fact, Mike Harrison and Ruth Williams were read and notable, having done a lot of work in this area. But in the world of computing, computer networks, Stolgar introduced it for switches, and it was followed up nicely by Shaw and Wishik. Okay. And so this is a fairly rich area as well. Okay, so third part of this, so let me just, you know, to, to make sure we're all tracking the theses. Uh, the first part of the thesis is free will, okay? When you're down there, you, stuff comes and then you just deliver, okay? And the, the description of the job is very clear, and that leads itself, lends itself nicely to a formation of a theory. Queuing systems are very natural. Uh, that brings in all this statistical and uh, structural type results, and there's a natural stability theory that forms from conservation laws. Third part, is that is, it really has, you know, when you say network science, 
What's the difference between network technology and network science? Usually when we say something is technology, it's, it means we designed it, we built it, it works the way we, we decided it, it was going to work. It is, it is entirely anticipated by us. There's no real massive surprises. But unfortunately, networks are so called emergent behavior. Stuff does, it, the thing does things, simple microscopic rules can lead to unexpected microscopic behavior. Okay. Perhaps the person who observed this quite a bit uh, in, in this uh, context is Frank Kelly, first with Lost Networks. And of course, the bridge paradox is similar in the, in the world of traffic. Uh, so there's a there's really interesting work by Kelly and uh, Graham, Carl Graham and Sylvie Melliard on Lost Networks and the so-called propagation of chaos. If something is independent now, will it be independent in the future? That's the idea of propagation of chaos. Uh, utility maximization formulation of bandwidth sharing and packet transport. This is for internet. So there's a famous title for a talk by uh, that Christos Papa Dimitri gave said, saying if TCP is the answer, what was the question? Okay. Actually, this is the uh, this is the area that actually <laughs> take picks up that question. Uh, to, you know, like this work picks up that question. If TCP is the answer, what was the question? Well, Kelly. Yeah, at all, and Lowe, Stephen Lowe, uh, formulated this sort of, what is the internet doing actually? What problem is it solving? And then there's all this sort of packet transport and condition control. The, the very interesting and very notable early work is by Mishra, Gong, and Towsley, followed up nicely by Sukhumi and uh, Srikant, and Padalini, Doyle, Lowe. Uh, I was uh, working with Rong Pan, and we standardized it as part of this IEEE Q algorithm, right? the, the, the layer three version of the IEEE means layer two. DC Q is layer three, and that's used in Microsoft for their backend storage traffic. And DC TCP is inspired by QCN, and it's layer three, and it's now deployed in Meta's. Meta is Facebook. Okay, just, it's Meta now, okay? And as GCN and Google, and so, uh, there's very interesting work on the analysis of DCCP by Ali Zade et al. Um, then there's flow level models. Okay. So the second, this, this last bullet, bullet analysis and design of condition control algorithms with delay differential equations, that's thinking of, thinking of it as packet level. The next one is flow level, introduced by Masuli and Roberts and followed up by a whole bunch of really interesting papers by others. Uh, Bona, Masuli, Proutier. Bertano, Moorbaum, Bramson, Air. Okay. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Sorry again. That's what I wanted to say about the third part. So, microscopic rules can lead to interesting or unexpected microscopic behavior. And that's sometimes, you know, good to model and capture. But really, the, if you say, well, if I was to sort of pick one place where, you know, where our theory is really quite central, is congestion control. Uh, it's very hard for practitioners to just do things and throw it out there because it'll be immediately subject to, you know, theoretical analysis and found wanting, if found wanting, remedies will be suggested. Okay? And will be adopted. That's just generally how it goes. Okay, so I want to say a few, few things about my favorite models. Um, again, this is again a personal perspective. The field is too big, not a lot of time. Okay, so please forgive me if it's not comprehensive enough, even even in the topics that I picked. So first, I want to go back to this world of manufacturing networks, clean theory before there were you know before client rock. There was no processing, nothing. There's no messages to send. You know, client rock was almost decisively the person who married engineering and the computer com communication network side to uh, queuing theory. But there was more manufacturing, studying queues in large government organizations and how, you know, the Road Transport Authority in the US is called the DMV. How many servers should you have in each of these booths? That's a, things like that to minimize. If you have your ex-employees that you want to deploy to man different uh, stations and booths, how many of you should go in each one of these things? That sort of question. I want to call all that processing networks. Meaning, jobs arrive at some queuing network, they process at one or more stations, and they exit. 
manufacturing, call centers, compute clusters, hospitals, large government organizations. There's a lot of examples. And the main goal here is the quantitative analysis of performance. What are the wait times of customers or jobs? How should we staff and plan capacity? How do we dynamically allocate resources? You know, if there are in a call center, exclusively French speaking, uh, you know, uh, call staffers and then exclusively English and some bilingual, how many of each should you have? Okay, think, how do you move this bilingual to take more of one language versus the other? That's dynamic. Okay, so main term here is Markov and Kuhn models. And again, his notable names are Kingman, Burke, uh, Jackson, all of the uh, other folks I mentioned there. Uh, I think really Kleinberg deserves a special credit. Of, you know, it's, it's worth noting him as someone who brought into communication networks of the packet switch type. Of course, communication circuit switch type was there before. Erlang long ago brought it in. Okay. Like circa World War One or something, 1917, something like this. Okay. So I should have put Erlang here. Okay. But I'm, I'm talking about packet switching. Okay. Okay. So very interestingly, as uh, the web came around and uh, jobs became heavy tailed and not light tailed, a lot of the heuristics that evolved in the world of light tailed networks were appended, where in fact it just uh, stood on their head. So, for example, the go go there are a lot of golden rules like resource pooling is good, meaning if you have 10 servers and there's a, put a common queue, don't put one queue per, per server. Uh, and the next server that's idle picks up from this common queue. That's called resource pooling. As opposed to I would only pick from the queue in front of me. And if I'm, my queue is empty, but other queues are, there's somebody there, I won't, I won't pick. Okay. That's called resource pooling. If you were to have a common queue, that's not so good if the job size is a heavy tail. Because it's possible big jobs will come and clog all the servers and the little guys are just stuck in, in the back over there. Okay. So if you look at rules that five items are less type white rule in a supermarket, you know where this is coming from. Okay. Process of sharing is fair and gives low average delays. This is uh, true in the way of white tails. But something that follows jobs of short size does much, much better than process sharing in the world of heavy tail work size work, uh, distributions. Okay. So this sort of stuff, uh, some of the people observed it, but I want to say notably, uh, Mon Harcourt Balter, both in the thesis and subsequently, was uh, really unearthing stuff and, 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 and drilling it into the minds of the practitioners. So she used to influence a lot of the way um, schedulers got built for, you know, like, for example, the Apache scheduler and so on. Okay. Okay, so communication networks, another favorite category of models. Um, this is where files or messages arrive at a network of buffers or, or switches, uh, and our job is to route or forward them efficiently. Okay. Uh, and, uh, for example, this is true in the case of wireless networks, uh, packet switch networks, input queue switches, switches with speed up. Input queue switches may speed up is one. That's what I'm distinguishing. Switches with speed up have buffers in the output side as well. The main goal here has always been to find maximum throughput, minimum delay scheduling algorithms. So the stability, so you want to find maximum throughput algorithms. So you, you, you find your algorithm and demonstrate that it's giving you maximum throughput using the up now theory. And again, uh, the notable work here, Tessilus' uh, thesis and his paper with Ephraimides was you know, very influential. And it, uh, it came into the world as packet switching by his paper by McEwen et al. And then uh, with Jim Dye, I wrote a paper on uh, removing it. And uh, sorry, it's a fluid model. So there's no distributional assumptions except a law, law of large numbers type constraint on the input. Okay, so most general possible. Um, the delay analysis was done through a series of papers. I'm going to note. Uh, this is for switching, okay. Sean Wishek, Zhang, Sha Tsitsiklis, uh, and very notably Magaluri Shri, uh, and Srikant. Okay, so this is really a surprisingly strong result. 
uh, they tell you exactly how many, you know, when the switch is using maximum weight scheduling algorithm, uh, they tell you exactly how many. Uh, well, There's a single bound, of, it's, it's 2n plus 1 or something, for n by n input queue switch. So it's a number. It's shockingly good. Okay. And uh, the emulation output queue switches will speed up something that uh, Nick McLean and I worked on, introduced the concept. And, you know, fairly uh, well picked up by uh, uh, Leonardi, Aol, and Chuang, uh, Aol, we, we wrote a paper on it, and Sundarayar, Nick McKeown's student, who's an IIT Bombay alumnus, I should say, point out. <laughs> okay, had a very nice thesis on this topic. Okay, so, they, we can't leave communication ever without talking about the most important thing about them, contention. Contention, collision, you know, is not, it's not scheduling. It's, it, 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 you have to, you know, you just CSMA, CD, okay? It's a classical problem. And lots of people are looking at a binary exponential back off type protocols actually stable. Can it be stable? Uh, in, the, in the early to mid 80s, seemingly almost everybody wrote a paper on it. I'm sure Vivek Boker has written a paper on it. I, I, I tried looking for it. You must have, because it's what you got, you, all of you guys did at that time. Okay, if you were a theorist, you consider this problem, okay, more or less. Okay, and then uh, mid 90s, there's a very interesting paper by Hastad, Leighton, Rogoff, which talked about how to use not just the state of the channel, but the, state, the backlog of the, of the node, at A node in question, when the N node is contending. And that led to uh, key node based scheduling policies by a uh, uh, a few people, Liu and Stoyar and Jang and Warron. And interesting and Sigmatrix test of time award paper by Raj Gopal and Shah and Shin settles uh, a whole uh, category of questions. Okay. So finally, uh, as I said earlier, condition control is like one of the, uh, there's no question about it. And uh, it's already been discussed, I'm not going to touch upon it too much. And randomized load balancing uh, is interesting because another one of those things that like, like Aloha came from the practice. Uh, so Dick Kopp told me, because he wrote an early paper on this, and I was talking to him about it, he said, uh, some implementation person in the mid 70s, to late 70s, even named that person, I'm sorry I didn't write it down, uh, observed that if you use two hash functions instead of one to you know, uh, hash, items into uh, onto, onto a hash table, you'll do exponentially better in terms of avoiding collisions. Um, that, as a heuristic, looked around until uh, this paper by Azar, Broder, Karl, and Upfo, a very influential paper, looked at that problem in the balls and bins model and showed exponential improvement. Um, it was converted into a continuous Queuing model by his paper by Wedensky and Dabrushin Karpelovich, and also by Mitzen Marker and his thesis. Um, and that was in the purely ex exponential arrivals, uh, sorry, positive arrivals, exponential server setting. Generalization of this took another 10 years uh, when I, would, I wrote a paper, Bramson and Liu in Sigma Tricks, that looked at using, uh, introduces Ansatz or weak independence which allowed us to use this cavity method sort of computational trick to get some explicit answers. Um, then Kavita Ramanan wrote some interesting papers, also Ravi Mazumdar, a bunch of others. There's actually a lot, large, quite a few people here. Uh, it's still active, okay? I, I just haven't been uh, you know, good at citing all the relevant stuff. Um, there's a general answer, which is still open, okay, from this uh, topic. Happy to talk to you about it all, offline. In other words, what we could deal with in the paper with Lou and um, Ramson and Lou was uh, service times with decreasing hazard rate that covers a certain category of heavy tail distributions. We don't know what happens with increasing hazard rate, for example. Okay. Uh, there's a general question that's open. How much time do I have? Uh, okay. Okay, so recent work. Uh, I was hoping to be better, but the way the two, you know, uh, the mirror sort of thing is working, I don't think I'll be able to show the demo, but, uh, it, you know, I'm going to 
do human animation to give you the illusion of a demo without actually doing a demo. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's go back to this point about this very systems lack of durable clock. Okay. Um, in fact, it's not just the racket. We as a community have hardened it into a dogma, which goes like this: don't trust the clocks. And as it says, who? There are textbooks that say so. Okay, we cannot synchronize them perfectly, so just don't go around messing with time. Okay. And Leslie Lamport, who did a lot of work in this topic of event ordering, partial orderings and total orderings, etc., uh, was in fact motivated to look at this question because it's not easy to order events when you can't trust the clocks and clocks, clocks are not trustworthy. Uh, when the store walls is pretty clear, when you mess with, around with time, pretty good chance things are things going wrong. The Google Spanner guys, just, the, I was quoting them, I said, don't trust time, okay? So, synchronizing clocks across the digital packet network is just a hard problem. That's really why, why all of us, all of the community of folks were saying this. But now, assume or suppose we can actually synchronize clocks a distance to a degree of accuracy that is really satisfactory for most practical problems. What can we do? That's what I want to ask. There's many things I'm going to claim we can do that we will need to do, but I just want to give you two examples. Okay. So first of all, how does this work? How does this clock synchronization work? It's just useful to, uh, for you to get some basic idea. I'm not going to describe the whole algorithm. Uh, I've spoken about it a couple of times, and uh, there is a paper on it, where there's also a talk by Elon Gang. So the first of all, the key idea is, you know, uh, the network time protocol is the most famous, well, well used, uh, you know, protocol for decades. Uh, if you want to be more precise and more accurate in your synchronizing of clocks than that, then there's this thing called the IEEE's precision time protocol. It does a very good job of synchronizing clocks. And what it does is it corps the network. It says if I want to synchronize clocks at servers connected by a jittery packet switch network, because that hinders synchronizing, I will first synchronize switches that connect the servers and then use the network itself to convey time from server to server. That's, that's the general idea. And a bunch of other protocols have been proposed with a similar uh, aim, similar starting point. We actually took it uh, differently. We let go of the network. So we just worked with the end nodes and left the network be jittery, noisy, whatever, but then converted noisy timestamps taken at the edges uh, and whose processing will allow synchronized clocks into a sort of signal processing slash ML type uh, work. Okay. Now, uh, it sort of allows you as a user to go to the cloud and just synchronize 25 clocks, 30 clocks in the VMs that you rented. The rest of the cloud can be doing whatever else it wants to do, but you, your system can be just doing its own thing, have accurate time uh, where all the nodes are synchronized. This could be interesting to you because you're running a distributed database. It could be interesting to you because you're running a, you know, uh, a distributed ledger of the, of the permission type. It could be interesting for many reasons. Okay. Uh, I've written some numbers for the accuracy. You know, in a single data center, you can get these kind of accuracies. Across data centers, it'll be worse in the order of a few milliseconds or sorry, in the order of a few microseconds or tens of microseconds, depending on path quality and asymmetry. The general uh, formulation of the problem is that I have n clocks connected by some packet switch networks. I'd like to synchronize them as accurately as possible. And the first thing is to introduce a mesh of probes. Each of these nodes probes some number, k, say equal to five, independent of n, other nodes or clocks, and sends probes. Probes carry transmit and receive timestamps, and they're acknowledged. So I send you a probe, you acknowledge it, okay? So in other words, the edges is bidirectional. And the overheads of these things are all discussed in the paper. I'm just putting it here saying it's light, okay? Uh, but it's an important 
metric to be you know keeping in mind so here's an example there are two clocks who have times ta and tb which are off from the actual wall clock time by some unknown deltas uh, probes are sent and acts received this gives you a four timestamps uh, a total of four timestamps using which you can do the following and every every almost every algorithm starts like this every clock sync algorithm says if i have a probe that i'm sending from a to b um, it's always true that the actual receive time equals the actual transmit time plus whatever delay was incurred in, in the in the network so the actual receive time is the the sorry, sorry the, the correct receive time is the actual receive time stamp minus the unknown correction right that's the corrected receive times time on the left equals the corrected transmit time plus the time in the network and if you rearrange terms so as to put the unknowns on one side and then lose this positive quantity of the delay you get an upper bound on this discrepancy in terms of two timestamps you have from the probe in the forward direction with the probe in the reverse direction you get another bound on the other side okay and now that you have these bounds by sending a lot of probes and acts you can plot them like this so uh, the the x-axis here is the time as measured by the clock at no day and the blue dots are all upper bounds on that unknown discrepancy which is on the y-axis uh, and the green dots are the uh, lower bounds the thick blue line is the sort of least upper bound and the thick green line is the least lower uh, greatest lower bound the point being that these are the probes or acts that make it without any delays but in this figure you see this uh, noisy timestamps that are in between in this wrong forbidden zone that just happened to this is from the google 40g testbed taken uh, you know three or four years ago uh, and then nick was placing timestamps faultily that gave rise to this noisy timestamps and so uh, they'll go away in, in, when you do the analysis uh, through some interesting trick okay but let's look at what the problem is if uh, you can find this middle red line it's like the separating hyperplane okay and you can do support vector machines can be used to, to do this with soft margin support vector machines if you can find it then what it says is that the time at clock a is zero the time of clock B is minus 93.3 microseconds. And the time of clock A is two seconds. The time of clock B is two minus 96.6 micro, microseconds. So what's going on is the clock uh, node B in this case is, is ticking slower by 1.65 microseconds per second relative to the clock at node A. So not only do they have an offset uh, in time, but they're actually off in frequency as well. Okay. So the whole paper is really about how do you find the right red line and what do you do, you know, how, how to use the network of clocks and probe mesh, et cetera, to get accurate clock sync. I, I won't go through the rest of it, okay, in the interest of time, except to point you to this paper again, if you're interested. The real application is the financial trading. Okay, so unbeknownst to us, we weren't even aware these guys were interested. Someone introduced me to some Goldman Sachs person rather quickly. The NASDAQ people heard and got interested. And they trialed this code. And then it was interesting to them because of the next slide, you'll see that there's a strong interest in moving financial exchanges into the cloud. And the cloud is not a friendly place. It's heterogeneous. That's bad for various reasons, I will tell you. Um, in many use cases, which we learned, accurate time stamping of market data, building fair financial exchanges, synchronizing clocks across trading menus, and is used by, you know, lots of folks. Okay, financial exchanges are migrating to the cloud. Um, there's this nice op-ed, which uh, the NASDAQ folks put out, and it, the cloud gives you scale. In, a, in an exchange where NASDAQ is now, so this is, this is a, they sit in a data center like this in New York or New Jersey or some place where, you know, they sit in places like this. This is the Marwa uh, for the for New York Stock Exchange co-location facility. So you, as a 
market participant or a trader, maybe Morgan Stanley, we one of these racks, and your servers will be talking to the matching engine, which uh, Nizi is running, and you'll be buying and selling against other traders from other places. But no matter what, the size of the participant pool in a, in a data center of this type is limited to, like, say, about 300 or so. It's hard to fit in more people without losing fairness. So what is this fairness? So let me tell you a little bit about that uh, quickly. So an exchange is a place where buyers and sellers meet. Its fundamental purpose or operation that it has to perform is to discount price of some asset and runs on top of these electronic exchanges now. The open outcry system, you stop right there. Okay, and then start shouting prices. Electronic trading means you go to this trading platform and its main job is to give fair access. So no buyer or seller should be advantaged. Uh, so what is that? Let me just draw this figure out a little bit. So on the left are all the market participants that are connected through a gateway, one or more gateways, in this case, N gateways, okay, to the matching engine of the exchange. There are many exchanges, example exchanges named. Uh, to the right of the line, the gateway is where the exchange does exchange this network. On the left is the market participant side of the network. And there are two trading loops here. One is on the exchange side, uh, the gateway to matching engine to gateway, orders go in and market data comes out. Uh, on the other hand, the other side is the trading, tick to trade. So as soon as I get some information about a market event, I quickly turn around and place an order, I place a trade, okay? Uh, I place an order. So, you know, speaking of financial world, when you say trade, they get mad because a trade is an executed order, okay? So don't go on, if you have financial friends, don't say trade when you meant order, okay? They won't, they won't like you. <laughs> okay, so fairness means um, on the inbound side, orders must be processed in a globally FIFO manner, regardless of what gateway they enter the exchange. Outbound fairness is just literally, you can't have information arbitrage. Market data should be simultaneously delivered to all the market participants. Currently, exchanges go to great lengths. They make all the wires the same length, and there's an enormous amount of effort spent uh, to make identical parts, parts of equidistance from gateway to matching engine. It's required by law, and if it's not there, the market parts will complain, and so on. The question is, how do you move this to the cloud? Okay. So I'm going to tell you how, really quickly, well, if you synchronize clocks, it's doable. Whether the uh, paths are equidistant or not, if your clocks are accurately synchronized, at, sitting at the gateways at the matching engine, you don't need really the matching engine, let's say, the gateways. You timestamp these orders as they pass through, on the inbound side and resequence these orders or before execution on the matching engine, depending on the timestamp that establishes global FIFO. On the outbound side, just put a hold and release buffer so that every or every market data you know, piece is released to the market participants simultaneously. Okay, again, clocks are important to be synchronized. Okay, so this is really the project we're working with these folks on. Uh, Chicago Mercantile is another major uh, entity that's moving to the cloud. They have a big uh, tie-in with Google, so it's all happening. So, in the interest of time, I'll skip this, okay, because it's 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 interesting. I'm not going to be able to show you the demo. I was planning to show you about this. Uh, I can tell you where you no, know, it's an NSDI paper, and it has stuff there that you can take a look at, okay. But it's made possible because clocks are synchronized, okay? So Don Marcus, I'm sorry, same as uh, on-ramp, okay? Uh, clocks are synchronized, that's what makes it all possible. And down to a sub-microsecond level. Okay. Let me conclude, okay? So, first of all, I think we're all, you know, uh, delighted, intellectually stimulated, the networking has provided a very rich context for theorists, whether it's algorithm or protocol design or in performance analysis. Okay. 
or by the single components end to end packet transport or these macroscopic models. Maybe that's the way to think of it. Okay, that is single components, pathwise stuff, or, or the whole thing. And theory has played a key role, continues to play a key role. We keep evolving. We don't have to, we have fairly general models. We don't, we're not reliant on stochastic uh, assumptions. Okay. Um, time sensitive applications are coming. So if self driving cars are controlled from the cloud, then you have to be, there's no way something that goes from the car to the cloud can be delayed in its, in its response. And as more of the world's uh, economic activity is moving to the cloud, so you're making more purchases there, there's this notion of deadlines and timeliness that's following it. It's not just batch processing or, or, and big data from like it was last decade. This is now real-time stuff, okay? And accurate clocks, clocks are interesting. Uh, I've, I've shown you this part about uh, financial exchanges. I have skipped through that condition control part, but there are several other things you can do, like build new consensus protocols, uh, build new forms of distributed ledgers, etc. okay? So let me stop with that, take any questions you can have. Thank you very much, uh, Balaji, for a very interesting and insightful uh, talk. We have uh, time for questions from the room. Uh, thanks for the great talk and congratulations on the award. So uh, I have a question about, uh, you know, Infocom is widely regarded as a premier network theory conference and SICOM is a network systems conference. But unfortunately, the two communities have grown really far apart. There's almost very little interaction between the two. Uh, even 20 years ago, there was a lot more interaction. So why do you think that is? Should something be done about it? And how do you position that with respect to your job? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, mean, I don't know the ex I've seen. And I, first of all, I agree with you that it is the case that they've drifted apart. Um, maybe the EE part of IEEE and the you know ACM part of SICOM are keeping the communities somewhat apart, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. At this point in time, it's all fully blended. And that's one thing I can think to say. But I think other, other thing is really, uh, we were talking at dinner last night, Manjunath and I and a bunch of others. There's a certain amount of hands-onness that is just required. A certain amount of theoretical knowledge that's just required, but it is you, you, on both sides, you know, it's, it's not just you and this other person get together and miraculously you do exactly what you're doing, they do exactly what they're doing, and, you know, uh, spontaneous combustion occurs and you produce something amazing. Is this like when I started hanging out with Nick McEwen, I had to learn a lot of what his language was to begin with, as an example, right? So, uh, you will notice I said I'm a close collaborator of system builders, I'm not a system builder myself, but I hang out with them quite a bit, okay? And so that's just required, I think. And that's one thing that may be a reason, uh, perhaps not, because people do hang out. I've seen them hang out. Um, I think the other thing I feel is that this impact, what do you consider impact, right? Often we think a good paper, which gives us intellectual satisfaction is good, but there's emotional satisfaction, which I think we tend to discount, which comes from seeing it be used. And, um, you know, I didn't appreciate it until I started the standardization work, actually. I was pretty happy to be doing some theorem or some argument and be happy about it. it was, I was happy. It was not, I wasn't ha unhappy. But it was a different kind of happiness when you start seeing things getting implemented. It's a messy thing. But it's like, you know, life sort of thing, right? Okay, let me stop there. Maybe there are other reasons. But I think joint events should be held is, is my you know, firm belief that it's, it's, it's easy to combine the two communities if, the, if we can see ways to get them together. Thank you. Um, other questions? Yeah, so I have a question that's kind of uh, maybe taking off from where Sanjay left off. I'm just wondering whether practitioners feel in, in the internet sort of space, feel they don't need the theory, right? You know, they, they build a thing, it works. I mean, it may be inspired by some loose uh, theoretical intuition, 
but they don't really need the theory. So my question to you is, do you have, you know, really compelling examples where either the absence of theory really, uh, you know, pull things down or introduction of theory made things much better. And I have a second question that's kind of related, like, you know, uh, the, the, the reality I think is that, you know, queuing theory and so on sort of works well when you have these sort of you know, continuous or sort of fluid um, uh, you know, uh, model uh, kind of approximation and those work well, but we look at TCP design, like if you're the last packet in the queue versus the first packet that got dropped, it's very different fates and the state of the protocol uh, is completely different. So I'm just wondering how well theory can deal with uh, you know, such discontinuities. Right. So first of all, I agree that uh, the practice, I was pretty, you know, I've observed it. Practitioners uh, don't really, they don't do it. They don't really find the need to do it. Uh, but to, to answer your question in a different way, first time I met Dave Clark in mid nineties, he said, and I'd just been finished my postdoc with Frank Kelly and that was what he found out about me. And what he had to say, and that both of them recently met, one just a system builder architect, the other one a theorist. And he said, I don't know when he writes what he's writing, but when he speaks, I understand him. I think at some other, other, you know, if you and I speak, I'm sure we understand each other, but we understand each other for other reasons too, meaning we know each other's craft a little bit, maybe more than those guys did at that time. But at the same time, you know, one of the things that happened when I, when I started working in this first startup was uh, an academic colleague, a theorist was asking me, what was my experience like? And I want to just say something, because this thing is interesting. When you look at a bright young theory person, like the abstract thinking is the prized quality you want to see in them. What that means is they'll sort of in their minds be able to axiomatically think about stuff that is physically hard to visualize, like brown in motion as continuous paths, but no way differentiable. And they'll reason about these objects without even being able to visualize it. And that then you accelerate these people. Fast forward, and we go on over there, okay? The such a thing on the other side I found is concrete thinking. There are absolutely smart people that do. But feels like this, there's some complicated, like a router, 700 page manual. This person has amazing ability to open the page and just the right one and say, this is the most important concept, okay? I've seen this several times and it's brilliant when it happens, okay? It's a sort of a skill, it's learned, but it's also innate. So let me say that about the first point. Um, you know, what are some examples? How does modeling work? Well, I think the thing is, theory can and does capture this. They, you know, the flow level models capture the sizes of flows and can, uh, add, you know, ascribe probabilities of success depending on the size. The longer files, uh, you know, uh, get through by bandwidth. Shorter files need all the all the little pieces, all the ducks should cross the, you know, pond, so to speak, right? So there are ways of, and people have done it. I think if you go one level above, where you know you are sitting at the boundary of a virtual machine, and then the stack latencies begin to come in, then theory just doesn't go down so well there. You just put a random time and say, I don't know what that's for, but empirically observed it. Yeah, uh, so your work on clock synchronization with jitter is really beautiful stuff uh, and it clearly has practical implications. But the second part of uh, the practical application, which you said, where you uh, try to synchronize the output, wouldn't the delay there be uh, determined by the uh, worst case latency? And so, what is the impact on this? On, you know, perhaps the goal should be to minimize the uh, jitter in the latency or the worst case latency? not just to synchronize clocks. Agreed. So the worst case latency in, in a single data center will be in the order of a few microseconds or 10, single digit microseconds. Uh, and if you look at what is the exchange uh, latency now, uh, this is the exchange side of latency. It's about 20 microseconds, okay? So it's comparable. If you have NIC timestamps, it's almost indistinguishable. Where the issue might come where market participants might be reluctant to move to the cloud is, because there's been arms race about, you know, the trick to trade side. That used to be about a few microseconds with a lot of hijinks and layer one switching, which I never heard, like this is amazing model. Layer one switching is like just in light, okay? Uh, they brought it down about sub 35 nanoseconds. 
this is just ridiculous. I mean, I don't know how the cloud can give that. But the question is, does it need to do that, right? Isn't the fair market interesting and isn't scale already interesting market participants, right? Um, they can continue to operate both things. So the answer to your question is the worst case discrepancy between the long and the short paths is a small percent, not necessarily small, maybe 20, 30% of the, of the length of the average path, okay? And that is not noticeable when you equalize them with, with clocks and holding, holding release buffers. Thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, a question about uh, this uh, cyclical nature of uh, going mainframe and then uh, distributed. Then there were a few in between cycles. Now we're going to the cloud. But then when you think of uh, applications where you're trying to, let's say, do autonomous driving, you might need quite a bit of uh, decentralized decision making. So, what do you think? Uh, what are your speculations on this yeah. cyclical nature of uh, mainframe? Industry? Yeah. Actually, I, I, I'm probably at the stage where I've seen one or two of these cycles, uh, having been in the field, right? Like software-defined networking brings back more control of the network, and I think it's the right idea. And it's very successful, okay? Um, after a whole end-to-end -end principle dominated, just do everything at the edge, this was brought in, right? Now, the th things like that will happen, okay? Because some advance in technology will, will make it happen or some application demands will require it, okay, like security being a notable one where the network needs to get involved, okay? Now, many of them my colleague with whom I work, I, he and I were collaborating on this with a bunch of students and industry folks is, he told me that in, in, in the world of systems, there, there are only three, look at the resources. It's bandwidth, it's compute, it's memory and storage. You just press one of these things in the bottleneck, you know, you alleviate the bottleneck, it'll just move there. You alleviate that bottleneck, it'll move here. And I think that's the cyclical nature of the whole uh, system. That's how it is. And these advances don't happen in lockstep. Uh, if you alleviate this bottleneck, it'll just, everything will go and get stuck over there. And then those guys will start working hard and move the bottleneck somewhere else. It's literally this hot potato stuff that keeps going on. I don't want to be the bottleneck. Or, or there's an opportunity at the bottleneck. That's the other way to say real world sees these are good. Congestion is good for business. Because I can jump in and do something there. You know, it's like that. So it'll happen. And then it'll stop. And I think we should just embrace it. That's just the nature of uh, systems, I think. Uh, we have one you. more um, virtual question if we have time, just for one last yes. virtual question. Yes, we have time for one more question. So, Manoj, if you would like to unmute. Yeah, hi. Uh, I, I had a question regarding the uh, clock, global clock synchronization. And I wanted to know what are the assumptions or conditions that need to be satisfied to get this kind of synchronization? I mean, I'm just coming from the uh, fact that probably you cannot do this over a wide area network. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, right? I mean, so th th there will be some prerequisites for this to work. Right. If you work at whatever distance, the, in fact, the quality at long distance could be as good as it's in a data center. Where it can suffer is that wide uh, links can be asymmetric. There is a forward and reverse. The probes and the, and the acts take vastly different times, vastly being about 10% more or less than in one direction. And uh, that can happen and does happen quite frequently because uh, long distance links use uh, multi-protocol label switching to balance the load on, 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 on wavelengths. So it can be going on blue light and suddenly you'll be switched to red light, you know, the red, red part of the wavelength. And that will cause you to go slower by noticeable amount, okay? So this is at the demo would have shown you that, okay? So there's no there's nothing fundamentally restricting it. Uh, distance is just you know uh, a value. Uh, you know it's, it's a scale free thing. Uh, where noise gets added, like always with things, and uh, asymmetry being the biggest uh, culprit. And so uh, yes, I think that that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. We have to stop here. So 
Thank you for a great talk and great discussion in the Q&A and congratulations again for your achievement. Thank you. Thanks.